This is Dr. Ben White with the Rational Wellness Podcast, bringing you the cutting edge information on health and nutrition from the latest scientific research and by interviewing the top experts in the field. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes and YouTube and sign up for my free ebook on my website by going to drwhites.com. Let's get started on your road to better health. Hey, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. And we have a great topic for you today. We're going to talk about how you can increase your memory, your concentration, your brain health. And we have a great guest. We have Dr. Stephen Masley. He is a nationally recognized physician, nutritionist, chef, and he's a creator of the most popular program ever on public TV, 30 Days to a Younger Heart. Dr. Masley is a best-selling author. He's published a number of books, including 10 Years Younger, The 30-Day Heart Tune-Up, Smart Fat, and his newest book, The Better Brain Solution, which is what we'll be speaking about today. Thank you, Dr. Masley, for joining me today. I'm very good to be with you. Great. So um, how did you come to write a book about the brain? It seems like a lot of your other work has been focused on the heart and, um, and, and fat and things like that. Well, in my clinic, we, do a, we measure 100 markers of aging. We do look at arterial plaque growth and you know, cholesterol and lipids and sugar and things related to that. We also measure brain function. We look at brain processes, speed, memory, attention span, reactivity, executive brain function. So we're measuring aspects of aging and we also look at food intake, nutrient intake, fitness, stress management, and toxin exposure. And we've actually been able to publish, you know, looking at hundreds of factors, which lifestyle choices improve your brain function, which hurt it. And from that, we've been made up a um, five-step, easy to follow, five-step plan. And when people follow it, our average person improves their brain processing speed and brain function by 25 to 30%. So it's really pretty amazing that we've proven that you can really improve your brain performance. And we've really done it based on the data we've collected at our clinic. Boy, that's great because um, cognitive problems, uh, neurodegenerative problems like Alzheimer's are really on the rise. In fact, I saw that now uh, Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative diseases are, are, are now the leading cause of death among women, at, you know, exceeding even cardiac and, um, and breast cancer as a cause. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, the number one most expensive disease in America right now is memory loss. And what's really scary is that's supposed to double in just the next 12 to 15 years. So we're spending 215 billion a year on medical care for memory loss. I can't even imagine it doubling. Um, and, and that being, and I think it's not just because we're getting older, it's because the number one cause for memory loss is elevated blood sugar and blood sugar rates are boring and going up and up. And that's causing this increase in memory loss epidemic we see today. Right, in fact, a lot of practitioners now are starting to refer to Alzheimer's disease as type three diabetes due to this relationship with blood sugar and insulin resistance. Exactly. So can you explain more about how, what, what does blood sugar have to do with the brain? Well, it really has to do with insulin resistance. So I mean, as you know, insulin's the hormone that helps us store energy. So when we eat carbs, whether it's a healthy carb, like um, broccoli or blueberries, or whether it's a refined carb when we get a much bigger blood sugar surge like sugar or flour, when those energy pours in, the insulin rises up and goes to push it into the cell. That's a normal function. Just like muscle cells, we push glucose in and we build glycogen. So when we go to work out next, you know, for our next workout, we've got glycogen in that muscle cell ready to burn as energy. The challenge is if we don't have a healthy lifestyle, we don't work out enough, we eat too many refined carbs, our cells become full. They no longer respond to insulin. In fact, they become insulin resistant. Once they're full of energy, they say, nope, we're not listening anymore. We, we can't store any more energy. But here's the irony. 
when brain cells become full of glucose, they shut down. They actually stop working. They are unable. Insulin resistance makes brain cells unable to process and use energy. So as an example, if I did a PET scan on your brain, you look, you know, super fit, healthy. I bet you would light up like a Christmas tree. When we do a PET scan and we look at energy burn on brain cells and some with insulin resistance, it's pretty quiet. I mean, nothing's happening. The brain is unable to process glucose's energy. It's dysfunctional. They have brain fog. They're forgetful. They walk into a room. They don't know why they're there. They read a passage in a book and they have to keep rereading paragraphs. Remember people's names. I mean, their brain's not functioning. And if that's not just a day or so, but it's ongoing, that insulin resistant state, the brain cells being unable to use energy, they become dysfunctional and then they die. And if they die, then every time a brain cells die, the brain shrinks a little bit. And if you have millions of brain cells dying, your brain is shrinking a lot. So insulin resistance, this abnormal blood sugar regulation, literally makes us unable to use our brain, shuts our brain down, um, kills off our brain cells, and it's um, shrinking our brain. And nobody should want a shrunken brain. That's right. what's happening with this whole process. And it's just, you know, who would have thought at a time when blood sugar levels are high, that our brain cells would be starving, but that's normal physiology. That's human body works. So it, it, an easy answer is you just have 10 Diet Cokes a day, right? And finish yourself <laughs> off. Yeah, well, I just, you know. <laughs> we, we see what that does to brain shrinkage. Yeah, just, to, yeah, just shrink your brain, you know, like a grape to a raisin as quickly as human. That would be an effective way to finish yourself off. Um, what is the best way to test for cognitive decline? in your office? Well, I mean, a lot of people, you know, there's so many labs we could look at, you know, like thyroid and blood sugar and sodium and mercury and B12. But I mean, I do cognitive testing on the computer. Very right. simple, very straightforward, you know, clinicians, um, chiropractors, physicians, you know, we can buy 10, 20 tests at a time and measure how does your brain function? I mean, we look at Memory, both word memory, visual memory, it looks at processing speed, literally brain processing, attention, can we focus? So I, I find, I've been doing um, brain cognitive testing on a computer with my patients, it's about a 30 minute test, um, for about over 15 years and I love it. So it's a really, I can tell 20 years that someone's having gradual decline, 20 years before they have real memory loss, that it's coming and then it gives us plenty of time to do something about it, try to prevent it. Which test do you like the best? I happen to use um, CNS Vital Signs, Central Nervous System Vital Signs. I don't have any stock or anything in them. It's just the test I like the best and the one I use in our clinic. Right, cool. So in your book, The Better Brain Solution, you write about 12 foods that will promote brain health. Uh, which are these uh, brain healthy foods so I, I kind of put them in, in groups. One group would be those with plant pigments, things like green leafy vegetables, blueberries and cherries, those anthocyanins, um, dark chocolate. You know, those pigments literally protect our brain from oxidation and inflammation. They block it. One cup of green leafies a day and your brain is literally 11 years younger than someone who doesn't eat green leafy vegetables. I mean, these. These plant foods are really pretty powerful, and we need more of them. Um, even coffee is beneficial, whether it's decaf or not. It's the pigment that's the big, it's not the caffeine. It's that coffee pigment that protects our brain. Now, with coffee, I mean, one or two cups of coffee has a benefit, maybe three, four more is actually harmful. You start getting jittery and you worse. So we call that a J, as you know, a J-shaped curve. A little bit is good. Excess is not better. And that also applies to alcohol. Red wine in moderation, like one or two servings with dinner, it seems all the studies I think universally show it improves brain function and decreases cognitive decline. Hard liquor and beer had no benefit. And if you drink more than two, three servings a day, I mean, no, it's not good. That's right. bad. So um, but all these are plant pigments. So those are all plant pigments that are good. Another category is smart, are smart fats. 
our brain, as you know, our brain is mostly fat by weight. It's 40% fish oil by weight and 60% fat. So we need healthy fats in our diet. And the idea of a low fat diet to me is, I think we've now, it's now a, a, a closed case. You know, they did the largest study probably ever with a low fat diet versus a Mediterranean diet where they added more extra virgin olive oil or they add extra nuts. And by adding nuts or olive oil, brain function improved and cognitive decline slowed down. And in those on the low fat diet, they, their brains just kept shrinking and they had to increase dementia. I mean, so yes, we need healthy fats like cooking with avocado oil and eating avocados and wild salmon and those, you know, all the seafood that's so good for us. Um, extra virgin olive oil, nuts, dark chocolate. Those are all great fats for our brain that we want more of. And then we need spices and herbs because they're anti-inflammatory. My favorite spices would be like um, Italian herbs or Italian herb seasoning, especially the rosemary or curry spices, especially um, turmeric, that curry spice, that yellow curry spices like ginger. So those are very anti-inflammatory. They, again, they block oxidation. And lastly, a probiotic. Um, I would really throw a probiotic in there as well. So those are like some of the dozen foods that I want people to add that have been shown to protect their brain. Now, you know, in your book, when you were talking about the healthy fats, I noticed that there was one healthy fat that's really embraced by the functional medicine community today, and that's coconut oil. And it's frequently mentioned as a fat that you should purposely take to uh, promote brain health and um, but I, I get the impression that you're not entirely convinced that coconut oh, oil I is mean, a healthy I, fat. I think of MCT oil as more of a supplement. Okay. So coconut. So I think the benefit has to do with you know the MCT, these medium chain triglycerides. But coconut oil only has twenty percent medium chain triglycerides. Right. It's mostly other forms of fat. So. Um, I think of MCT oil has been used in clinical studies and shown for people with mild cognitive impairment to improve their brain function. So that was really great. Um, coconut oil has not research. That's the MCT oil. And most people, and the MCTs were probably from coconut oil, but it's a refined source. It's an extraction. So it wasn't really the coconut oil that did that. No, I think, you know, of coconut milk, I, I mean, my recipes in my book, the Better Brain Solution, I have coconut milk in my recipes. I mean, I like using it as a food source, uh, but we don't really have the data for coconut that we do for MCT oil that's out there today. And there is one cardiac concern about coconut oil in that in people who have known cardiovascular disease, when we give them coconut oil versus olive oil, they showed endothelial dysfunction, meaning their arteries literally constricted and they showed increased oxidation. So I don't recommend people with known heart disease or people who are being treated with cholesterol meds add coconut oil, because it can increase cholesterol 50 to 70 points. But average person, I think for athletes, I think it's a great fuel source. So like if I'm on a two, three hour bike ride, I'm probably going to use coconut milk in my shake before I go to get those MCTs. Um, so I think of it as a healthy food source. I think it's probably good for the brain, but not proven. Um, it's great for athletes, uh, but I, I'm, I'm still waiting to see. We don't have the proof like for olive oil or for nuts or for seafood, which clearly have been shown to have brain health. We don't have that yet for coconut oil, so I'm glad you asked. So is the worry because of the saturated fat content? And where are you on the role of saturated fat in heart disease? I don't know that saturated fat is really related. I think there's a lot of controversy out there. I'm more on the side that um, it's probably neutral. You know, I think of saturated fats as they're not harmful, but I can't say they're benefit. It's not like proven benefit. No, but I would, I think most of those studies that have been really looked at recently show probably harmless. So um, I, it, to me, it's a bigger question, is it clean? You know, does it have pesticides? You know, does, you know, if you're eating meat and butter, does it, is it organic? Is it from pastures or is it coming from a feedlot when they filled it Roundup and all these chemicals? So right. I'm much more concerned about, is it a clean fat than is it saturated fat? And the only, now 
there's one yacht to that. And there's this, all this controversy for these people with the APOE4 genotype. 20%, as you know, probably 20% of the population have an APOE4 genotype. They tend to have more oxidation, more inflammation. They have a higher risk for heart disease and for a memory loss and Alzheimer's disease. They also get sick less often. They have a better immune function thanks to all that extra inflammation and oxidation. Um, but part of the concern is people with the APOE4 gene tend to have very high cholesterol. And, and saturated fat tends to increase their cholesterol even more. And there's actually studies that show in the APOE4 folks that um, more saturated fat increases beta amyloid production. So for an average healthy person, I'm not, I don't even, saturated fat isn't even on my, one of my discussion points. I don't even really talk about it. But if, for people with the APOE4, I think they, I, I, until we have evidence, and right now we don't, I'm going to recommend they be cautious. They keep it, you know, moderate one or two servings of something that might be higher in saturated fat foods per day. And otherwise, they don't really worry about it. But I, I did want to throw in that one caveat for the APOE4 individuals. What about for cooking? What's the best oil to use for cooking? Because there's a lot of controversy, you know, when you see different charts and one chart will say virgin olive oil is extra virgin olive oil is good till 375 degrees. And, and, there's, and there seems to be a lot of variation and everybody's confused as to, you know, if you're cooking at uh, a medium heat or a high heat, or even what temperatures I heat, which oil is it better to use? A, is it okay to use coconut oil? Should we? That's a really good point. I'm really glad you brought that up. So like, if I'm using extra virgin olive oil, the smoke point's 400. So I never go above 375. So if I'm going to put something in the oven, and I've got extra virgin olive oil, I don't ever, I mean, either 350 or 375. I'm, I'm totally with you there. That would be it because I don't want it to be damaged and then right. we convert it to like trans fats and all that. But coconut oil is even less. The smoke point on coconut oil is 350. So I would probably never cook it more than, so there's this myth that coconut oil is good for high heat cooking, but we know make it hydrogenated um, when you cook it past press. So I don't go above 325 if the smoke point's 350. I'm only using low or medium low heat. So if I want to do something with coconut oil, I'll probably use avocado oil because it tolerates up to 520. So you can use medium high or high heat for avocado oil. And then if I'm going to do a curry thing like that, and I want to use coconut oil with it or coconut milk, I'd wait till I drop the heat to simmer at the end. And that's when I put in my coconut milk, or that's when I put in my coconut oil for flavor and to get those nutrients with it just at the end on simmer. So other ones you can use at high heat. So high heat, one of the best is pecan oil or avocado oil. By the way, what is high heat? What temperature is high heat? More than 475. Okay. I think of medium high, like what we do most of our sauteing for vegetables and protein, it's probably 450 to 475. So you could do almond oil, macadamia nut oil, you could clearly do pecan oil or avocado. Avocado is like my favorite cooking oil now. But another alternative would be organic ghee. You know, that clarified butter. That tolerates up to like 475 degrees. Now, why is ghee better than butter? Butter has a smoke point of 350. Oh, okay. So butter by itself, it, you, it starts to be damaged and it turns brown as soon as you hit medium to medium high heat. And you know, when you purify it and they, you, know, you cook it at low heat and the foam comes up and you scoop off all those bubbles and you're just getting it down to that, an oil that is very stable. Um, so ghee is basically clarified butter. You process it, you've heated it, it creates a foam, you take all that stuff off. And what's left, now the butter then once it's been clarified, can be heated up to about 475 and it's still safe and stable. Cool. So ghee would be, yeah. So if you want to do something butter-like flavor, and then ghee also is pretty much dairy-free. All the dairy protein's gone. So for that 10 or 15% of people who are dairy intolerant, almost all of them can tolerate ghee because all the proteins are gone once you do that and process it. Cool. Um, what do you feel are the most important nutritional supplements that can promote brain health? 
Well, there's some clear things the brain does not function well without. So low vitamin D, that's a major problem. And you know, probably half the people are vitamin D deficient. You know, you need at least 2000 a day, maybe up as high as 5,000 to get what I would call a good level. I usually aim for 50 to 60 for someone's level. Isn't it amazing that even in places like Southern California, that all these people are low in vitamin D? Because we test vitamin D and it, it's, you know, very commonly low. I'm in Florida. It's the sunshine state. 80% of my patients are low or more. I mean, you need an hour a day in a bathing suit between 10 and 2 almost every day to make enough vitamin D from the sun. If you're, unless you're a teenager, you know, for most of us who have a working, you know, life, you know, we would need an hour a day every day. And none of my patients get that. And if you use sunscreen, you don't make any. So, I mean, who has the time to go out for in a bathing suit for an hour every day? Almost nobody. So, okay, we have a friend in common. Okay, she might come close. <laughs> but I bet she might wear sunscreen and then you don't make any vitamin D when you do it though. Right. And, uh, and then the other thing is trying to drive our, our cholesterol levels so low because the body converts the sunlight, it, it, it takes the cholesterol and converts that into vitamin D. So if you're taking statins or you're on this quest to drive your cholesterol level as low as you can get it, that makes it a lot harder to uh, produce vitamin D as well. Yeah, so I just recommend a vitamin D supplement. I mean, yeah. other nutrients, we need B vitamins for our brain to protect our DNA and, you know, so mix folates. Um, vitamin B12 is very common deficient today in this day and age. So I usually give extra B12 and a, not just folic acid, but a mixed folate that has the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Magnesium, 70% of adults are low in magnesium. And if you're magnesium low, you slow the synaptic connections between your brain. So you hurt your brain processing speed. So a good multi, you could get your vitamin D, your mixed folates, um, chromium for your blood sugar, and adequate B12 right there with you know a two pill um, multi. You probably have to add magnesium. It does. You can't really put it in a multi. You'd have to either eat your wild salmon or eat or take a fish oil pill. And then I'd also throw in a probiotic. I mean, just you got to support your gut. It's there's a major gut brain connection. So those would be my top ones. A good multi with adequate vitamin D, B12, mixed folates, add magnesium, add fish oil, or eat salmon, add a probiotic, or eat fermented foods. And if I did one more, I'd probably pick curcumin, that turmeric curry spice extract. I mean, the data for that is really promising that it's gonna not just help prevent cancer and make our joints feel better, but also help protect our brain. As far as B12, um, most multivitamins, uh, commercial ones, a lot of them have cyanocobalamin, but uh, there are also methylcobalamin and there's even an acetylcobalamin on the market. Which one do you recommend? I like the methylcobalamin. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean cyan, you know, it's actually cyanide basically. <laughs> But the cyanocobalamin is so right. it's not it's not like it's a big dose but right. methyl i mean just in theory methylcobalamin you're absolutely right would be a lot better choice um but it's probably not since we're talking microgram you know i'm talking but i'm looking for a minimum of 100 up to 500 micrograms a day to make sure we really get decent levels a right. lot of the multivitamins, commercial ones, only have two or 10 micrograms. That might be fine for an 18-year-old with a totally healthy gut. But a lot of people, by the time you had 40, 50, 60, it's inadequate to give them an adequate level. And they actually are at risk for permanent neurologic harm if they don't get enough B12. And if people have uh, MTHFR or some of these other genetic SNPs, they may not be able to absorb conventional um, folate and, and B12. So they need well, it. Yeah, because most of the regular supplements are folic acid and they can't right. convert them to the active form, the 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate or the 5 methylene tetrahydrofolate. So if you can't, so up to 40% of people can't convert them. Now, I mean, so some clinicians are measuring, you know, methylation factors in all their patients. I just pretty much give all of my patients a mixed folate supplement to take every day to just so I don't have to worry about it. But right. I mean, it's, it's almost a coin. It's almost, you know, at 40%, it's almost like a coin. It's half our patients. So, right. I mean, I just treat them all is pretty much it's, I think it's pretty darn safe and healthy. Um, so I just make sure everybody has folate support. 
Can you explain how exercise is important for brain health? Well, at least the data from our clinic show that the number one factor that it improves brain processing speed, literally to make your brain quicker, sharper, more productive, is fitness. It's not about how many, we saw zero relationship, this is interesting, no relationship to minutes spent per week. All the relationship is with how aerobically fit you are and your muscle mass and strength. So independently, aerobic fitness clearly helps brain processing speed and even increases the size of your brain and helps improve insulin resistance, which is the number one cause for memory loss. But strength training does too, independent to, that, to aerobic activity. Adding more strength training, adding more strength, muscle mass, improves insulin resistance. Um, it helps enlarge the brain. You get brain-derived neurotrophic factors that go up. We actually, 80-year-olds have been shown to increase the size of their brain when they add strength training. So we really want some aerobic work and we want strength training. We want both on a regular basis. And it, to me, I think when I look in the literature, it's the number factor in epidemiologic studies that's associated with preventing dementia. And in my clinic database from a thousand patients, it's the number one most important thing for brain speed. So I mean, we we can't we we'd be crazy. I know you're a sports you know um, medicine buff, so activity. I mean, we always knew for our heart, right, or for our waistline, but now it's like it's the most important thing for our brain as well. So that's even more reason that people should be out exercising regularly. What, what about dosage? How, how, many, how long do people need to exercise for? How much should be strength versus cardiovascular training? And how many times a week should they exercise? Well, I don't know if you do. We do fitness testing in our office. So everybody I see is required to come in and do push-ups and sit-ups and sit and reach and VO2 max stress testing. So I'm like, um, you know, they, they show up in gym attire. And that's what, that's what my patients expect, you know. No, that's just part of other doctors' offices. They get a blood pressure. With me, they're doing push-ups and running up a hill. And I go through their nutrient intake and harass them over their food. So that fitness testing is just the standard for our clinic and what we do. So, but we, so I don't. I want them to be. When we measure fitness, we compare them like to their age group. I'd like people to be in the top third for someone 10 years younger than their age. That's my goal. And if you're not in the top third of fitness for some 10 years younger, it's not good enough. Get out there and work out more. So I don't work on minutes. I work on, because it shows the minutes they spend doesn't matter. Now, but you could say, well, how much practically do you have to work out to get fit? Interval training makes it easier and quicker. You can get the same aerobic workout doing 20 minutes of interval, intense interval training, 20 minutes, three days a week, as you get from 30 minutes of moderate activity, five days a week. So let's see, would you rather work out 60 minutes a week or 150 for the same benefit in reducing insulin resistance? I'd rather do intervals three times a week and then do strength training twice a week and then add yoga once a week. To me, that'd be like an ideal routine. And then maybe one day you just do a moderate long thing on the weekend, like a 23 mile bike ride or a lot, you know, like a two hour bike, you know, so I like three intense days, two strength training days, a yoga day, and one or two long moderate days. That's to me the ideal workout routine. Cool. Um, so um, in your book, you were talking about the software program, Heart Math. Can yes. you tell us what that is and why you like it? So we measure food and nutrient intake and food intake. And are you cutting out the sugar? But we also measure how in your fitness, but we look at stress management. So we do blood levels and look at DHEA levels. If you stress yourself out, your DHEA levels tend to drop. So we don't want that. Um, but we also correlate it with, I've been doing heart math now for a few years. So on everybody who comes in, we give them two minutes to try to, to do an exercise of a meditation, you know, a meditation trial. How calm and quiet and relaxed can you get in two minutes? And we hook them up to a monitor to measure their heart rate variability. So a little probe that goes to their ear, plugs into either our computer or their smartphone, 
and it, their heart rate should have this nice, gentle variability when they get coherent and relaxed. But I'll tell you, three-fourths of my patients are just flat. I mean, they're stressed out. And even when they try to relax and get calm, it just makes them more agitated, to be honest, <laughs> if they're not good at it. So it's a feedback tool. So it basically, heart math tells you, are you calm, semi-calm, or agitated? And you, it gives you a color code. Calm is green, semi-calm is blue, and agitated is red. So if I say, try to relax for two minutes and it turns red, I can show it to them and say, you're not very good at getting calm. Why don't you try thinking of something else? They, you know, I'll say to someone, think of going to the beach. They don't, you know, I don't like, and they go, well, I don't like sand and I hate the seagulls and, okay, don't go to the beach then. <laughs> Make you so it's learning it's a feedback tool so i'll think i'll say try a mountaintop or go on a meadow or go in your backyard or if it's a parent with a child i might say imagine you're sitting in your room watching your baby sleep and you just watch them and they might turn green and i go okay that's what makes you calm practice doing that so it's a really fabulous feedback tool to help people get calm i mean you know, a lot of, I mean, sometimes with people with low DHEA levels, I'll put them on DHEA for their fatigue or low libido. But in some ways, you know, it's like I am, as Dr. Sidney Baker would say, I'm giving them a Tylenol when they're sitting on a tack. It feels better, but I haven't fixed the problem. Right. I think the challenge is we need to show people how to learn to get calm and Start at two minutes and try to get at 10 minutes a day, we get real benefit. So that's not much to ask. If you would be a lot more productive and healthier and feel better and be more focused and literally more productive, I think we should do it. So that's how I use heart math in my clinic. And it's really actually been um, kind of amazing to see how helpful it's been for many of my patients. Great. Let's hit one more topic. Let's talk about the role of toxins such as tobacco, mercury, pesticides, etc. You know, we all know that we live in a very toxic environment. And how do these things affect brain health? Well, the brain's the most sensitive part of your whole body to brain. I mean, if you have elevated pesticide levels, you're 350% more likely to get Alzheimer's. That's a lot. We really do need to worry about pesticides. Um, tobacco. People think, okay, I'm going to smoke because it makes me a more alert. Well, our data actually shows it increased attention span. They do focus better, but they can't process information. They have a big drop in brain processing speed and overall cognitive function. So they did perceive correctly, okay, I like caffeine, I'm more stimulated, I'm more awake, but they can't problem solve. So what good does it do them? So, you know, um, tobacco's out. <laughs> Alcohol, okay, I said one or two glasses of wine, but more than that's clearly a toxin. Pesticides are very harmful to your brain, but there's like a couple others that I think people don't think of. You know, there's BPA line cans, BPA two cans a week, and it increases your risk for diabetes 20%. It increases insulin resistance. Number one cause for memory loss. We got to get rid of the BPA cans. BPA now, is like, tough because, you know, BPA is in a lot of things. You touch a cash register receipt, you know, they're almost all BPA. And then I recently learned that the BPA free ones we get are made with recycled paper. So included within the BPA free cash register receipts are receipts with BPA that were made into the paper. I think the biggest source though comes from eating these cans where it's leached into the food and it's the content is really high in just one can of food. So stop eating out of cans that have BPA lining. That's not that hard. People could do that. Stop cooking with plastic. Do not, it drives me crazy. Do not put your food in a plastic container and heat it up in the microwave. Are you kidding? <laughs> plastic is porn. And so even worse, some people put that like wrap, plastic wrap over their food. Yeah. Are you insane? It's going to melt like cheese into your food. Don't do, I mean, you know, that's a, that blocks testosterone, it blocks hormones, it causes insulin resistance. So get rid of the plastic when you cook, get rid of the BPA cans. Everybody could, that's not that hard to do, but that would make a big difference. Another one, nitrosamines. 
you know, these nitrate-like chemicals they put on deli meats and hot dogs and pepperoni and bacon to extend their shelf life. Yes, they last a lot longer and the company makes more profit. I get that. But these nitrosamines, one, we know they cause cancer. That's not good. We now know they increase diabetes risk. That's bad. But most recently, they've been shown to be neurotoxic and kill brain cells. So we can actually kill off and make rodents have Alzheimer's just from eating the amount of bacon people would get from going to the restaurant every day. One so, of the tricky things about... Yeah, so my point is don't eat meats with nitrosamines. They should be organic, pasture-raised, and nitrosamine-free. You know, one, one of the tricky things is I've seen some labels on some of these deli meats, and some of the natural ones now have nitrates added from celery. And are these natural nitrates uh, really any better? Well, the nitrates in, in like beets, those are good for us. I mean, that's what we make nitric oxide out of. So there's a big difference between nitrates in a beet that increase blood supply or spinach or, you know, um, purslane and rocket salad. I think that's a, those nitrates in plants are healthy. Nitrosamines are totally different chemicals. And I know they kind of, they lump them into nitrates together. And I think you're, I'm confused by it too, to be honest. Yeah. So I'm looking for anything that looks like a nitrosamine word, even vaguely similar. No, if it says celery nitrate, is it really a celery nitrate? <laughs> or is it a nitrosamine, this chemical process they made right. in the pesticide plant? So, um, I, I actually don't know the answer to that about the right. celery one, but. So how do you get rid of these toxins? Do you put your patients on a detox of some kind? Do you use chelation? What type of? Mostly I stop them. I say, stop eating food with nitrosamines. Don't eat out of cans. Don't eat out of plastic. It, there's no point in trying to detox if you're not going to get rid of the sores. That's right. back to, I'm taking a Tylenol because I'm sitting on a tag. <laughs> <laughs> and it does feel better, but no, it's not good enough. Once I've got them to do that and they have symptoms, yes, I, I probably do do like a one or two week detox. Um, they sweat, you know, I use curcumin and milk thistle and have them do saunas and take all the alcohol out of their diet for a few weeks, you know, kind of a, right. you know, partial fasting where they're fasting for 15 hours a day to get some ketones going. So yeah, I do. A, I, I would rec. I think it's an excellent idea that people do a detox, you know, a couple times a year to help get the chemicals out. But first, we got to stop ingesting them. Do you use glutathione or any of these? Uh, uh, a lot of nutritional supplement companies have um, have detox programs set up. Uh, do you use any of those? What do you think about I've, those? I've I've only used glutathione on a K. I don't use it regularly in my practice. So. Okay. That's not one of my regimens, but I would definitely use like a full support nutritional program, um, supplement program, um, detox, you know, like garlic, sulfurophane, uh, curcumin, milk, milk thistle. It's, I use those things when people are on a detox. Right, stuff to support the liver, which is your yeah, main everything detox that helps type you. one and type two detoxification. Yeah, cool. Okay, hey, this has been a very interesting interview, Dr. Masley. Um, for uh, for listeners, viewers who'd like to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to contact you and find My out website, more? DrMasley.com, D-R-M-A-S-L-E-Y.com. I've got a free quiz they can take, and you know if they take the quiz, I'll, you know it gives them an idea of how's your brain doing. Why don't you? It's just 60 seconds to take these 10 questions. Really easy. You get a score, and I give them my brain better brain shopping guide. If they'll take the quiz as a bonus. What are the 12 foods you need to eat every day? What are the 12 things you have to avoid to protect your brain? That's great. Com. And your book is available everywhere that books are sold, Amazon. Yeah, it's a, it, and we really, this just this week, I mean, it just took off. The book's just come out. We hit number 16 overall on Amazon. Awesome. It, it hit um, number one for 10 different categories on Amazon. That's great. So I'm really thrilled that it's going to be able to, I'm hoping it can make a difference. I mean, I need, you know, you and I and others like us need to work together to get the word out. We got, I mean, it's crazy that 
sad standard American diet. And it's really time for us to make a difference and change the paradigm so that we're looking at people improving their health instead of just getting treated for the disease. Yeah, and I highly recommend Dr. Masley's book. I just read it. It's clear. It's easy to read. It's got good, useful information. So until and next time. Recipes. I really yeah. love the recipes too. Cool. That's great. Okay, thank you, Dr. Masley. Thank you. I really appreciate the time. Okay, excellent. Talk to you in the future.